This is a Whole Observatory podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Welcome to Star Stuff, the space oddity. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Star Stuff Season 2. And today we have a very special guest. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. My name is Dan Fleisch. I'm a professor of physics at Wittenberg University. And that's why I wanted you to introduce yourself, because the spelling of your last name. I was like, I know I'm going to butcher that. It's the German word for meat. Is it really? Yes, it is. So Fleischmann would have been butcher. My great-grandparents came through Ellis Island. They cut the name short, and I wound up with meat for a last name. So when I took German in college, (laughs) my professor went, meat, this is your name? Meat. Yeah, meat. Flesh. I mean, flesh, you know. Oh. Yeah. Can we, I think flesh is really cool. Yeah. It's well, like, flesh, apparently to Germans, is not a good last name. But I've been living it? with it for 71 years now, and so it's fine. Well, if, I mean, if you were like a, an MD, that would be perfect. That would be good. A Dr. surgeon. Flesh? A cutter. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Flesh. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And uh, so he's an astronomer in residence at the Grand Canyon. I wore this specifically for you. Well, thank you very I, much. Very I stylish, I Thank might you. Say. It's and, very, like, in, I think, right now uh-huh. with, like, the color palette. Uh, I, I don't wear a lot of merch and stuff like that. Uh, but I have to, I have to rep the Grand Canyon. Yeah, of course. Really and cool. uh, I have to say, I was not very experienced with Grand Canyon when I applied for this. Really? I had never been. So, yeah, somebody asked me the other day, so how did you get selected? And I could not for the life of me remember <laughs> where I saw this, but I have an image of me sitting on my back porch reading a magazine called Sky and Telescope, which I read fairly religiously. And we have advertisements in Sky and Telescope at the oh, Observatory. Well, yeah, I've been paid to mention that. Yes, thank so, you for the plug. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there was an ad in there, but somehow I made that connection okay. and uh, it just worked perfectly. That was last, dis, uh, well, it was probably last October. And then they notified me in December, maybe a year ago on the 21st that I had been selected. Oh, okay. So that was a surprise. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. I figured, wow, is it possible no one else applied? That'd be, <laughs> that would explain a lot. But Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, the first time we got some feedback about our podcast, it was alerted to us that we were the number three astronomy podcast. Wow. And I was like, good to know that there are three astronomy yeah, podcasts. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and, and Haley was like, no, there are there are a lot. Yeah. So you should be, that's should, that's something to hang your hat on, yeah, as we be, say in Texas. You guys should be very proud. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank and you. so the first time you went to the Grand Canyon was as an astronomer in residence. Almost. I, I decided I have to go down there before I'm being paid to do something there. Yeah. So my wife and I came down in May. Uh, my mm-hmm. residency started on November 21st. We had come down in May and it was not particularly clear while we were here, so I didn't get a good look at the sky, but I was so blown away by the canyon itself. And you know, you see all the pictures and you think you have an idea of what that is, but there is nothing like that three-dimensional being in it. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. one of the objectives, as you may have known about my residency, is to help people understand this sense of awe. Mm-hmm. And the canyon, the two examples I always see used for what it means to experience the emotion of awe are gazing at the Grand Canyon and looking deeply into the night, dark night sky. Yes. And so I thought, that's perfect. I can do both of those things at the same time. So having been here for just a couple days in May, I was not quite ready when I came in November. Yeah. First night I was here, it was a new moon. So oh my that means that the stars are as good as they get. I went outside and they're putting me up at Vercamps, which is right on the south rim. Mm-hmm. So I took a little telescope out. I was just getting it set up and I looked up and I thought there were clouds in the sky. And I go, that's the Milky Way. Yeah. And I just found tears. I'm yeah. s- at that time, I was 70 years old. I had never cried in astronomy before. But <laughs> somehow, that sky was just so overwhelming. And I, the next morning, I go, oh, yeah, emotion of awe. You know, this is what I was experiencing. So so that was my first night. I figured, oh my wow, gosh. it's going to go downhill from here. Welcome to but, Northern Arizona. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But it has really, really, so I'm three weeks in. Mm -hmm. It was going to be a four-week residency, and I asked to extend it for two. I'm having such a good time. (laughs) They don't know yet, but I'm not leaving. I'm just (laughs) just going to settle in. 
<laughs> it has been going so well. Yeah, That's three weeks fantastic. in, I am just having, as I told uh, Raider Lane, one of the Rangers. I was going to say, you get along with Raider Lane, I can I do, tell. Do. And, and <laughs> I do, and I was saying the other day, this is among the best professional experiences of my life. It has yeah. been really amazing. Yeah. So. yeah, I bet. I mean, I'd like to just like be a fly on the wall to hear you guys go on about. Yeah, we do go on. <laughs> I'm <That's> sure. <laughs> Yeah, Raider's great. He's been on our podcast a few mm-hmm. times. Yeah. Um, and his his tours are fantastic because of yeah, the poetry. He's great. Yeah, knowledgeable, the history, he knows the sky. Yeah. I do, all the Rangers. Uh, you know, one of the reasons this has been such a positive experience for me is the Rangers. Yeah. They are they're helpful, they're knowledgeable, they're they're so friendly. I, mm-hmm. I watch them interact with the visitors to the park and I think, wow, they are just no matter how big the issue is or how we name the question, they are really just always there for people. And I, you know, I'm thinking right now with all this anti-government propaganda, these people are representatives of the government and look at them. They you are. Know? And they have adorable little hats. They do. They They're do that. As a matter of fact, I, a, a few <laughs> days ago, I bought a, I bought a hat. Did you I buy a, a Mountie Stetson. hat? I bought a Stetson. They don't sell you the other ones, but no. I, um, so I, 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 it just felt big and too much. Mm-hmm. So I walked in and I said, is this too much? And I, and they all said, oh no, it's great. And then I go, look who I'm talking to. They're all wearing Smokey the Bear hats. Yes. But anyhow, so I have been wearing my Stetson, although Where is it? It's I didn't bring it today. today. Oh. It's a little big and I, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be standing on the rim because I stand on the rim for a large part of every day. Mm-hmm. If I'm just walking along to go get lunch, I'll stop five times just to oh, walk. Yeah. And I've been there three weeks and I'm still doing this. Mm-hmm. But I know what's going to happen. One day, the wind is going to take that hat and it's going to go down into the canyon. Yeah. And I figure that will be, be a, the end of that. A part of the history. Of right, exactly. <laughs> you need one of those little, little straps. Yeah, I need that. I, that's exactly what I need. But I'm not quite that big a geek just yet. Oh, get another by the end of the two weeks, <laughs> you're going to have the strap. Well, I probably will be. <laughs> that's fantastic. And... Um, yeah, in case no one's heard of the Grand Canyon, um, it is incredible to see in person. And I, you know, I've talked about this a few times on the podcast, but it's almost difficult to see it out of 2D when you're looking at it. Absolutely. Your brain doesn't comprehend the, the, the size and, and how big it yeah. is. I mean... So I've been reading about this. Oh, uh, I don't, enlighten I don't, us. I tend not to read psychology magazines, but I've been reading about what people experience with this emotion of awe. And they say some of the components are perception of vastness. Yes. So obviously, physical vastness is one example. So the Grand Canyon and the night sky both fulfill that. Yeah. And no. need for accommodation. Yeah, they do. And need for accommodation. At first I thought, so you have to have like a motel room. That's not what they mean. They mean you have to accommodate what you're seeing into your perception of the world. And somehow that canyon is just unlike anything that I thought could exist in the world. I mean, I've seen pictures from, you know, there's a canyon on Mars that's many, many times bigger. And so I have an idea of that. And yet standing up the real thing here on Earth, I, I needed to accommodate that somehow. Yeah. And they say, when you do that, it can lead to feelings of being better connected with other humans, and it can lead to a feeling of self-diminishment, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. Because with that feeling of self-diminishment comes reduction in uh, narcissism, ego, uh, ego, uh, entitlement, Mm -hmm. arrogance, and I'm going, okay... Right about now in the world, that would actually be a good thing to have less of those things. So I am. Oh, yeah. So again, part of my objective there is help everybody ex- who is interested in it experience this emotion of awe and and just have those feelings. So that's one of my two main objectives. And I mean, you sound very much like a poet, and you know, a, I've never a, been a writer accused, of literature. I've never been accused of that. Well, in looking at your bio, uh, I am surprised by that because you are a math nerd. Yeah, somewhat. <laughs> Just yeah. a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, well, what is it? I, I, I slightly characterize that differently. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most in life is to figure out a difficult math issue, like an equation or what a certain kind of calculus operator You're means. You're right, not a math, math nerd, not a math nerd. And, <laughs> and then figure out how to explain that. Oh, and okay. And so that's my books. Are, my books are all called Students' Guides. Yeah, I see and that. that's why because I write them for students. I actually had one professor after my very first one get in touch with me, and he said, "You know, it's like this is written for students." 
But, you know, the title should have been a giveaway. Yeah, it's like, hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Because Reading I comprehension. Think it, I think it is true that a lot of books are written by professors for professors. And in my oh. case, that's not why. I wrote the books. Uh, I write my books as though I'm, I, I want people to think, I wish I had had this when I was studying physics. Because I wish I had had them when right. I was studying it. There so. are so many. <laughs> <laughs> At first I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to read through the titles. I was like, yeah, no, I'm nah. not. No, I'm not. They're, they're, just, they're Cambridge Press students' guides. I've been so happy with Cambridge Press. This is a, a university press that goes back hundreds of years. And they have treated me so incredibly well. That's why when I talk about the Grand Canyon experience being one of the professional, uh, most rewarding professional aspects of my career, the other one is working with Cambridge Press. Because okay. I, when I first sent in a proposal for my very first book, I thought my chances were slim and none. <laughs> and the fact that they got back to me and, and they weren't immediately on board. They do peer review. It's a university press. So they send the books out for peer review. And as the process developed and I came along, this has been 10 years ago now, it just was, it became like a freight train. I just I just felt like I was being pulled along by this. And the first time I ever went to Cambridge, most author, authors don't even ever go to their publishers, but I wanted to go there and meet some people and see what was up. So I get there and they sit me in the lobby and there's a wall behind me and it says Cambridge Authors. And I could not help but notice that on that wall was Stephen Hawking oh and... Gosh. Trying to remember who else, maybe Albert Einstein. You know, I just, by the time they came, to, you know, by the time whoever I was meeting came out to meet me, I had shrunk on that little <laughs> sofa I was sitting on. I'm surprised they could find me. I was like a speck <laughs> on that sofa. And so uh, that first book came out. It was called The Student's Guide to Maxwell's Equations, yeah. which had been recently voted by some readers of a physics magazine to be the most important equations ever devised by humans. The Maxwell equation. You, which is curious because most people have never heard of Maxwell's equations. What's the, Max <laughs> what's the Maxwell I equation? I do like the cover art. <laughs> I'm oh, marketing, so I was like, I really like the cover art. Thank you so specifically much. Specifically of, of that one and uh, the, is it Laplace? Laplace. Laplace. See, every time. Yeah, that's, my most, that's my most recent one, as a matter of fact. I see that, and yeah. I actually took the picture that's on the cover of the Maxwell one at a different place, a place called Goonhilly in England. And so... It's called I just, what? Goonhilly. Okay. G-O-O-N-H-I-L-L-Y. Goonhilly. It sounds like a, an insult from Texas. Yeah, it does. <laughs> doesn't it? Exactly. Anyhow, so, so my relationship with Cambridge Press, they actually... Mm -hmm. So, so my idea for the student's guide was, it, it wasn't really just mine. There had been a student's guide before this called A Student's Guide to Fourier Transforms, published by Cambridge University Press. So when they started asking me about my idea for a student's guide, I said, actually, it's from your previous books that I got that idea, but now we've made it into a series. And so mm -hmm. I'm the editor of that series as well, which means I review other proposals for students' guides that Cambridge publishes. That's amazing. So yeah, you it's could, really been good. You could be reviewing a book by the next Stephen Hawking. Uh, that could be, although <clears throat> I would probably not be qualified to do that. <laughs> but yeah. So what is the Maxwell yeah. equation? Since we touched Maxwell's on Maxwell's equations, I will just say very quickly, they are a set of four equations which describe almost everything about electromagnetism. Electricity and magnetism, when they are put together in certain ways, can make light and radio waves and x-rays and gamma rays. And Maxwell's equations, which he did not write, by the way, he, he collated equations from other physicists of his day, and he yes. added one term to one of the equations which allowed these uh, phenomena of electricity and magnetism, which we tend to think of as electric circuits and little magnets that have magnetic fields around them. When you put these four equations together, you get waves, and waves are light or, as I said, these other forms of electromagnetic radiation. So the fact that in the 19th century, Maxwell put these together, figured out what light was, and then actually determined the speed of light based on electrical and magnetic properties. He did that? He did that. It was Maxwell. truly amazing. And I actually, as I was writing the book, I got to go to the one of the libraries at Cambridge where his papers are stored, and they brought me an envelope and I opened the envelope, and out of it came some of the devices that Maxwell used. He also took the world's first color photograph, and he had a little thing called a color wheel that you could spin and get different colors. His color wheel falls out of this envelope they brought me. Now, I was wearing gloves at the time, but I felt like... I need to be really careful here. First of all, I felt like I am in a league I should not be playing in. And then, uh, and it was just, that, that's what I mean by the freight train. I was just carried along with that. 
Uh, I think he is one of the great, I think uh, Newton and Einstein and then Maxwell, he is absolutely in that league really? of physicists. Yeah. Do you have a dog named Maxwell? You know, I should. I <laughs> just realized I should have four dogs, one uh, named after each of the four Maxwell equations. Right. What a great idea. <laughs> and then you will truly be a math nerd until you have done that. I revoke the title. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, these uh, the books. I mean, seriously, the cover art is is beautiful. Mathematics of astronomy, which is sounds incredibly intimidating. I would probably <laughs> not dare to touch it, but the the cover art is really pretty. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that very much. I had a co-author on that. Two of my books I've co-authored with former students. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, that one was uh, Dr. Julia Craigenau, and she and I went back and forth on the cover art a little bit because the cover art takes some liberties. It's got something mm -hmm. in orbit around something else, and it's not technically correct if you look Here at it in go. one way. <laughs> and I didn't care. Yeah. And Julia, to her credit, really did care. And yeah. so we modified it. So okay. now it is better. Yes. Well, I feel this in marketing a lot. Really? I, well, I was a, I'm was i an English major and oh. I had a marketing career and now at an observatory where it's like, wow, this is really pretty. And uh -huh. I'm like, that's not No, accurate. you can't do it that way. That <laughs> would like, never happen. It's like, oh no, I, I have know. to learn the mathematics of astronomy right. yeah. to create a, a marketing right. piece. Having said that, I think you do have to walk a fine line yes, between there, something that line. looks right and good and it's going to cause somebody to pick up the book and you don't want it to be technically wrong. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of bad pseudoscientific information out there right now. Yes. And so that's one of the things I really do work at with Cambridge on the covers is let's make it attractive, but let's make it correct. Well, and the good thing about space is it's so easy to make it attractive. It does all the hard work for exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> so what is the mathematics of astronomy? Pretty much uh, everything uh, in the universe has it's, a mathematical representation. How big is this book? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I make them all pretty small because I told Cambridge on the, before the very first one, I said, I want them less than $30. Maybe I said 30 pounds, but less than a certain amount of money. And they came in at that, which means they're, you're limited in number of pages. I think for you can't students? do more than about 230 pages for that. Did you do that for student budgets? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted I students you. to be able to, yeah. Well, like, Haley's behind the camera. Yeah. Nate's on vacation, and like Haley, That's professors, so cool. listen, yeah. listen. This is amazing. It is so difficult on a student budget to get textbooks. I mean, I used to like just sit there and Xerox oh, yeah. copies in the library. Bad news. It gets worse in graduate school. <laughs> I remember when I first got to graduate school, the first book I had to buy was one hundred and forty dollars, and this was you know, 40 years ago. So, uh, yeah, but I will say this. Students do have other options because within one week of every book I have published with Cambridge Press, I can get a PDF online from illegitimate sources, which I do not encourage students to do. <laughs> but I am astounded at how what an ecosystem has developed to take the... I cannot imagine how it happens within a week I mean, where do they get the manuscript? Not me Xeroxing things yeah, in the right, library. Okay. But Xeroxing, can you imagine page by page? Oh, it took hours. It really did imagine. take hours. Because yep. some of these books um, in universities, I remember, I couldn't check these books out. So if right. I wanted to study oh. outside of library hours, yeah. I had to sneak down into the basement in Xerox sure. pages. And the professor say, oh, I've got them on reserve in the yes. library. Good luck with that. They're oh, all, always luck. checked out. Right? Oh, and every year, oh, here's a new version. And this that's is the, the one other that's one. mandatory. This is especially true in astronomy because there's so much going on yeah. right now. But it's also true. I still remember the first time I ever, so I live in Ohio and I'm at a little university. Oh my gosh, where? I live in Springfield, Ohio, which is no between kidding. Dayton and Columbus. And the first time, when I started teaching, I was thinking about astronomy textbooks, and I went over to Ohio State to see what they use. And I still remember, I walked into their bookstore, and the stacks and stacks and stacks of astronomy books. Because I, I, I never knew anybody who wrote books for, technical books, for money, right? You just don't do it for money. And yet, when I saw these stacks of astronomy books, I realized, this is business. Mm -hmm. There is big business here. Now, for I me, am. a gigantic class might have 45 students in it. But at the big universities, astronomy classes, the intro astronomy classes, they'll often have hundreds and oh, hundreds yeah. of students. And so it has become a business. And mm -hmm. that's un I, I consider that unfortunate for the very reasons you're talking about. Yeah, my, my astronomy class, which I did take. Really? Listeners. <laughs> yes, oh. I loved astronomy and almost... Um, I would 
semesters after that just helped my astronomy professor grade papers that is for great. fun just because I that loved is really, it. That She's is really great. trying to get me to go to UT, uh, which is like write me a letter of recommendation, but mm -hmm. uh, even with scholarships, it was too expensive. Oh, so, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, so I stayed at my state university and I found my way here. So it worked okay. out in the end. Also, I'm not great with numbers. It's like I have a little dyslexia with numbers and I read oh, them. Oh, really? Like immediately backwards. Interesting. Not great for math. <laughs> yeah, that could, could be a problem. Yeah, a little bit. Um, Although this morning, as a matter of fact, when I was talking to Kevin, uh, your historian, about us, uh, somehow we got onto the Apollo missions to the moon. I wonder how. With and, Kevin? Yeah, Kevin exactly. talking about lunar landing history. And so we're, we're, we're talking about how many astronauts had set foot on the moon. And I'm counting the Apollo missions, and I keep skipping Apollo 13 because they never landed. But I'm also skipping that finger on my hand. Oh, no. <laughs> so I keep coming up with 14, and he says, no, there were only 12. So this idea of a little math dyslexia, apparently yeah, it's not it. disqualifying <laughs> from being at least a physics professor. It's good to know. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Schindler has been on the podcast a few times. He's What a oh, knowledgeable individual. He's amazing. He really I just can't say his name without a silly grin yep. on my face. He's fantastic. Uh, and if you ever want lunar history fun facts. Yeah. Gosh, he just spits them out. Yeah, he, you exactly. should see his office. Once he, we did a fun little video for TikTok, I think, and we did a little tour of his office. Did oh. he take you to his office? No, I did not oh, see his office. Gosh, I it's just imagine. floor to ceiling. Right. So he opens the closet and things are just falling sure. out. He's like, "Oh, look, an Apollo." Yeah, that's like, the file, <laughs> That's the filing system, right? That's yep. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but fantastic, and uh, I am curious the the mathematics of astronomy. Um, were these like explaining equations yeah, or were not, you talking I, I, about... I apologize for not answering your question. Mm -hmm. the, the book was written, Julia and I wrote that book for students who are taking introductory astronomy. In some universities, some professors make it very non-mathematical. But there are a lot of universities and a lot of professors who do a more mathematical version of introduction oh. to astronomy. Okay. That includes me and Julia. She went, no. she went to Berkeley. She's at Penn State now. And so we thought those students who are taking the more mathematically uh, oriented, you know, astronomy 101, mm -hmm. those students often express dismay with not having enough math background. So we wrote that for them. Okay. It is not meant to be a treatise in the higher mathematics of astronomy. <laughs> okay. So it's in the very basics of things like, why do the units on an equation matter? You know, instead of just oh. plugging in numbers, you got to think, are these meters or are these centimeters or are these some other units? Seems okay. pretty basic, but you would be That's surprised how, how often students will not include the units. And when they do, it makes it much, when they don't include them, it makes it much easier to make a mistake that you don't catch at the end. But if you have the units riding along with you, you often find at the end, you go, wait a minute, I just got the mass of Jupiter in miles. Yeah. Somewhere I went wrong. And so this How many book, feet is Jupiter? <laughs> there you go. So, uh, so there are two things that we were really working hard to get students to appreciate is one, the value of equations, not as something you plug numbers into, but as something that expresses a relationship mm. between the brightness of a star, for example, and its radius and its temperature. And if you look at an equation as a, a statement of a relationship, that's powerful. Whereas if you look at it, if you plug in a bunch of numbers, it's still a solution, but it's a solution to one problem. Whereas if you have, in terms of algebraic variables, L equals 4 pi r squared sigma t to the fourth, which is the luminosity equation. Letters should never be in math. It's a sin. It, it solves millions of equations. Oh. So we really work hard at getting students to appreciate equations, not in, in what we call them are tools. And I've never known a carpenter hmm. who said, oh, yeah, I am so scared of that toolbox. Yeah. You know, I don't want to look at that hammer. So that's what we try to get students to do with these equations and, and the mathematics of astronomy is to look at the mathematics as a tool for a deeper understanding. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, and I think that's the one thing about uh, just looking at some of these equations, even the beautiful one that's, that's over the, um, the cover of the Maxwell Equation oh, yeah, Student yeah. Guide is what I see there is just information and every little, like every letter Yep. Means something. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Actually, the way I wrote that book, then what I did was so I took every symbol in the equation and I did what I called an expanded equation, where I took the symbol and then I had a little section on that symbol. 
Hmm. And then I went to the next symbol and I had a section on that. Hmm. And that turned out to be hugely popular. So I do these expanded equations in all my books now. That's fascinating. I mean, I feel like if I had um, a mathematics professor like that in in university, I probably would have been more excited about math. Uh, I mean, teachers are... I had some great math teachers Mm -hmm. when I was growing up, but especially um, in my university, I I did not. Yeah, it can be a problem. And here's something I've noticed. Uh, Really, really smart people often have trouble remembering why something is hard. Mm -hmm. That seems to apply especially in mathematics. And so one of the things Mm -hmm. I work so hard at is to try to remind myself what this was like when I first saw it. And why it was hard. Different language. And so, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I had um, Sam Houston State University is where I went, and particularly incredible English professors. Oh, yeah, isn't it and great? I just I have soaked, a great professor. Uh, uh, I took every, every, I mean, that wasn't even my major. Yep. I was going to be an archaeologist. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I just, by the time I was a junior, I'd taken every single English course. That's great. And yeah. so when I was a senior, they're like, you should take your intro courses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember the uh, grammar was one of my favorite ones. Mm-hmm. And it really was like math. I mean, yeah. we had these huge See? boards where we would separate out every... Yeah equation of that's, a sentence. That's the kind of thing I like to do. And yeah. You divide it up into the pieces and all of a sudden something that starts out looking really complex. Now, I think you have a deeper layer of understanding yeah. when you do that, when you take it apart and analyze the pieces. That's why I always, one of my best friends at university is English professor, Bob Davis, who is an expert. He wrote, he wrote a book on Walt Whitman and Whitman had written a poem about the learned astronomer. Yeah. In which an astronomer is is giving a talk and you know graphs and tables and all that, and the audience member who is writing the the uh, poem uh, actually gets physically ill <laughs> and has to go outside and look up in silence at the stars oh. to recover his bearings. And I so, love that. yeah, so I really I try to bear that in mind when I'm thinking about. I think you can understand the technical underpinnings without losing the magic of astronomy. But you really need to keep both in mind. So it's it's a challenge, but that's my talks that I'm giving at the Grand Canyon. Yeah. I have equations in some of them. Oh. And, and I can feel the audience reaction when I, because I, I announce it at the start. I say, we are going to have some equations in this talk. And they're, uh, I think, often hoping for pretty pictures. And I do try to do that. But I also have some equations that I walk them through and I say, we will get through this together. We will take them apart piece by piece, and we'll see why it's worth knowing this. So I think there's room for both. And how uh, do you plan to join awe and math during your residency? Ah, okay. So first of all, I think Whitman might say they're antithetical, right? If you you know if you if you delve too deeply into the math, you're going to lose that sense of awe. But right, I don't well. I don't quite agree with that <laughs> because remember. One of the things is perception of vastness. And vastness yeah. can be physical, but it can also be an intellectual vastness or a talent. So somebody who plays the piano expertly or somebody who... Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity uh, was such a mind-bending thing where instead of thinking about masses attracting one another with some Newtonian force, thinking about space-time being warped around the sun. And so the earth is like a, uh, it's as though you have a heavy weight on a trampoline and the earth is a little marble that is rolling around that surface. What a way to think of it. Haley, I'm going to tap you in. <laughs> I Yes, Haley has specifically Haley. Uh, so she's the co-host here on the podcast. Uh-huh. Has broken my mind with these facts. Ah, excellent. They Good are idea. literally my, I mean, it's like, once you just hear that sentence, uh-huh. there's not really thinking after no, that because your exactly brain just right. buffers. Yeah. You're like, wait, right. time See? warps around mass? You know, you, okay, so that is awe because you yes. are now feeling a need for accommodation. You are trying to accommodate this yes. idea. I'm that uncomfy. The sun <laughs> I need an adult. <laughs> change the space time around it. So we're just trying to go, you know, go in a straight line, but in this weirdly warped space time, the shortest distance is this almost circular path around the sun. So yeah, I'm so that's awe and mathematics together. 
Wow, I stumbled right into that one. I had no idea where I was going at the beginning of that sentence. So It's your next book. <laughs> a student's Guide to Awe and Mathematics. Well, yeah, there you go. So what are you hoping to um, to produce as like a deliverable, I guess, out of this experience? Oh, so mine's a little different than many. First of all, I think many of the astronomers, well, there haven't been that many astronomers in residence, but oftentimes program. What, what happens is that... Um, they are doing, as you said, they're developing something, doing some research, or uh, I know one was a, a poet who was writing was some poetry. Yep. In my case, I felt like my deliverable are the 20 presentations I'm giving. It's a lot. After every one, we're doing an observing session where I do a, a sky tour of the constellations as and which planets are up and some other things. And then I have telescopes set up, and we actually look at some deep space objects as oh. well which if you've ever looked through a telescope at a deep, deep space object, they're almost always fuzzy little blobs. Mm -hmm. But what I do is, so we have a couple of telescopes set up showing Jupiter and Saturn where people can actually look through the eyepiece. What I do with my telescopes is I have very powerful astronomy cameras on them. And I take mm -hmm. the images and I have a projector and a screen that I brought with me from mm -hmm. Ohio set up, a big movie screen kind of thing, and I project the image. Yeah. Now, I... Rader and I talked a lot about this. I Do bet. we lose something by not having people look through the eyepiece, but by just projecting an image? Mm -hmm. Because after all, if I'm just going to project an image, why don't I just, just go get a Hubble image? Yeah. And then why do they even have to be there? Why can't they just be watching online if they're not looking through an eyepiece? So here's what I've developed or come to. When we set up, I first uh, turn the camera on, turn the projector on, and I don't make the exposure long. I don't do all of the image processing that's going to turn, say, Andromeda from a fuzzy blob mm -hmm. into a galaxy with spiral arms and companion galaxies. I start out with maybe a five-second exposure, and I haven't stretched the image at all, and so they see a fuzzy blob. Then I manipulate the image, stretching it, and I turn the exposure time up to 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So the Andromeda galaxy comes swimming into view, if you will. Wow. And the, it fills in, the spiral arms appear. Once again, they're still looking at a flat two-dimensional image, mm -hmm. but they somehow feel, as far as I can judge, that they're participating in this in a way almost yeah. like looking through an eyepiece. Mm -hmm. So That's brilliant. it's really turned into, so the uh, presentations and sky tour leading into this kind of observing session, I've really felt that this has worked out well. Well, I'll have to say too, um, the first time I looked through a telescope was actually, because um, I got lost in my astronomy lab and I missed the day that we were supposed to look through a telescope. Oh, because that's it was dark. unfortunate. I know. I was Wait, so upset. one day in a whole semester class. There's one, one day. day. Yeah, yes. I mean, Welcome to Texas. Uh -huh. um, but in West Texas, you know, they're, you know, right, right kind of below us. There's um, McDonald Observatory. Observatory, sure. And... We, we partner with them. I love McDonald Observatory. You know, uh, they, they hit the moon with a laser, right? Yeah, yeah. they did. <laughs> they sure did. Uh, we, um, yeah, we actually just did a, a live stream with them recently-ish. We did the Mars Opposition ah, with them. They're excellent. fantastic, good friends of ours. Uh, that's the first place I saw the Milky Way was, mm. a, was at Big Bend National yep. Park. Yep. And uh, yeah, and also where I first looked through a telescope, actually not at McDonald, but it was one of their telescopes. And... One of the things that I saw first was a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to expect. A lot of people, you know, it's hard to imagine. Saturn, for example, right. mind bending. There's it's beautiful. The rings, you see right? the rings and you're just yep. like, I that's I'm looking at it exactly. in real time. And um unless you have a storyteller that's like, you know, very poetic, mm -hmm. uh, which luckily I did, but you might look through a telescope and just see like, oh, those pricks of light are closer to right. my face, I guess. Right. Um, but when you're looking through to a galaxy and someone says, yeah, that's Andromeda. Uh -huh. That's an entirely different galaxy that right. we're going to collide with. Um, there's even in that fuzzy-ish blob, just blob <laughs> yep. the fact that you are perceiving an right. entire galaxy through exactly. one pupil yep. is... I know. It, it, once again, need for accommodation, right? And especially when a few facts come with it two and a half million light years away. So the light has been traveling a billion feet per second for two and a half million years, and it's arriving here tonight. Damn. And as I always tell groups when I'm describing this, and if you don't look at that light, 
it just hits the ground and is wasted. Yeah. So I hope they all feel a little responsibility to look up once in a while and drink yeah. in a few of those photons. Well, and it's it's amazing too because it's like yeah that you know your the photons are absorbed by by your eye uh -huh. and they've been and that's it traveling right. that then. long yeah. just to yeah. be perceived by you yeah. and it's such a special moment. Yeah, if only we could get people to pay for that. What a great idea. <sighs> yeah, man. Commercialization. I know, right? Really. Maybe they ought to buy a ticket yep. to Lowell Observatory. But it also just happens every time you look up. Yeah, it's exactly just, right. Just, oh I my mean, gosh, most it's of amazing. the stars you see in the night sky are 50 to 500 light years away. Yeah. So that light, you know, that's no slouch, right? Traveling that fast for yeah. 50 to 500 years. Well, and I mean, you know, I mean, you can make um, a poem out of a grocery store trip, but it's it's it is amazing to think about. Just the, the the space and distance yes. between the, what the you're The idea perceiving. that looking out into space is looking back in time is one of the most important understandings that people can have. Mm -hmm. The other one I like to have people on the ground looking at the sky is to get them to look at the colors. They're not a lot, not easily seen. And for somebody like me who doesn't have great color vision, my color vision is so bad it was almost enough to keep me out of the draft in the, I was growing up in the Vietnam era. Mm. And I, so I, I'm not great on color vision, but even I can see when you look at certain stars and, and temperature, uh, color is related to temperature in stars. So when you see Betelgeuse and it's looking reddish, that means that's one of the less hot stars. I never say cooler because oh, yeah, the cool. least hot star, you can melt lead on the surface. <laughs> yeah. So Betelgeuse being red means it's maybe 3,000, 3,500 Kelvins. Whereas you look right across Orion and there's Rigel, which is looking oh, blue. Oh, Rigel. And it's much hotter. It's, you know, 10,000 Kelvin range. Which is confusing in color theory. I know. It's exactly backwards <laughs> from the bathroom. Yeah. Right? Where red is hot yes. and blue is cold. Come on, Somehow people. astronomy. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll yeah, fix well. that. Yeah. yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it's amazing because um, I, I we just actually recorded a podcast, uh, one of our last podcasts for season one about Rigel and, and Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah. I mean, even looking at those through a telescope is cool because right. it's like exactly. you're, you're even kind a of star, a famous even a star. star. Which, which you, you could never hope to see the actual photosphere, that yeah. what we would call the surface of the star. It's still a pinpoint of light, but it is cool. And double stars are especially good, I was going to say, what's the one that goes blue? It's the it's it like might, a cop car. Blue, red, blue. Because they're... Yeah. You might be thinking Alberio. That's the one. Yeah. Alberio. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. One of my favorites. It's in the Northern Cross, which is also Cygnus the Swan. Making it easy to find for me. Absolutely. Yes. That whole summer triangle, I spend a lot of time there yep. because that's also got the look back time. Uh, the three stars in the summer triangle, Altair is about 17 light years away. That's in Aquila or Aquila the Eagle. Uh, Vega, uh, you remember Vega? Yeah, Jody, yeah, Jody yeah. Foster's dad lives on the beach. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In, in contact. And uh, that's 25 light what years a good away. Movie. That's <laughs> 25 light years away. And then Deneb at the head of the Northern Cross. Deneb is the bright star at the yeah. head of the Northern Cross. And its distance is quite uncertain. But the lower numbers that I'm seeing recently are 1,600 light years away. And the farther ones are over 3,000 light years away. I've kind of settled on 2,600 as the number I use the when I'm talking one? to people. Well, it's not the brightest of the three, but it is plenty bright. Yes. It is one of the brighter. It's probably 19th brightest star in the sky. I mean, sky. you can see it with your naked eye. Oh, yeah. Yes. And it is something on the order of 2,600 light years away. So think about that compared to Vega, which as I said, was 25 light years away. That means it's 100 times farther, right? And if you make something 100 times farther, it gets dimmer, not by a factor of 100, but by 100 times 100. So Deneb is at a disadvantage due to its distance of 10,000 which means it's one of the brightest stars it's in the galaxy. It's real bright. Exactly. And so, you know, we're using the word brightness in two ways here. And this is one of the things I'm trying to get people to understand in my talks and, and uh, observing sessions is we talk about apparent brightness, which is what you see when you look at the sky. And you go, Vega is fifth brightest star in the sky. That doesn't say much about its intrinsic brightness. Right. For that, which we call luminosity, you have to factor in the distance. So Deneb, even though it's slightly dimmer than Vega and slightly dimmer than Altair, the other two stars in the Summer Triangle, it is way more luminous. Oh it's God. just so freaking far away that it's probably 200,000 times the brightness of the sun. I know. What? Can you imagine? That's amazing. That, we're talking suntan 
you know, oh my definitely God. change of wardrobe if you're orbiting yeah. that star. That's incredible. So and anyhow, so I use the Summer Triangle a lot because it's I got love, so much in it. It's yep. so easy to reference, especially it, for a newbie. And easy to find. And yeah, easy to right. find. Yep. Um, and really cool to see the the color yeah. shifting. Um, so, yep. so colors, look back time. Yes. And then we often use the constellations to talk about some mythology and the stories of the sky. I was going to ask you what's your favorite. Many. Uh, what, my, what your favorite one is. Oh. Well, I always feel the need to talk about the whole Cassiopeia and her husband Cepheus and Andromeda and Perseus and Pegasus. But I feel like it's done to death. You cannot go to an astronomy sky tour without getting that story. It's true, but I mean, Romeo and Juliet will uh, never die. Exactly. Even so, so. What, I start, what I did, actually, my first night sky tour, and I, I, I'm, I'm thinking this is one of the things that I uh, helped my, my situation with the rangers who have been so good to me. I started talking about Cetus the whale, which is the sea monster in that story we just mentioned. And I was uh, pointing to a, a super powerful laser pointer and pointing at one of the uh, stars in his tail, Menkar. And it's also, it's known also as Alpha Seti. The yeah, Alpha generally reserved reserve for the brightest star, or let's call it the most prominent star in a given constellation, and Seti being the possessive form of Cetus, the whale. It's the, In Latin, Cetus would be the subjective and possessive would be Seti, so Alpha Seti. Mm-hmm. So I'm starting to tell this story. I'm going to say if you're a science fiction writer, you would then maybe reverse those and call it Seti Alpha. And I get a little ripple from the crowd because Star Trek fans are starting to yes. recognize SETI Alpha. Uh-huh. And I say, if there are planets going around, if you call it SETI Alpha, and there are planets going around it, you might call the fifth one SETI Alpha 5. And now there are a couple of people in the <laughs> audience who are vibrating. They know where I'm going. But Raider and a couple of the other rangers are looking at me. Oh, Raider, bless like, your what is he? What is he doing here? And I go... You guys have probably heard of SETI Alpha 5, and some people are looking blankly at me. And I go, think rich Corinthian leather, <laughs> Ricardo Montalban, and they're still not getting it. So Ricardo I go, I know, Montalban. You'll, you'll, you'll get it with this. And I do my very best Bill Shatner impression of going, Con! <laughs> And at that moment, some of the audience leaps back. I'm holding this little Mr. Microphone set up, you know, with a microphone and a little speaker. And I blow out the diaphragm. Three people near me move back immediately. But I see some of the rangers looking at me because they have recognized the very, very important con episode of Star (laughs) Trek and the movie. And uh, so... I, that doesn't quite fit in with the Greek mythology and some of the very important life lessons there. But I think it's important also to bring in something from science fiction from the 1960s. I have a very important question yeah. that I do not get to ask sure. very often. Um, next generation or original series? You have to understand, I'm 71 years old. So the original series, the original series yes! was just yes! Thank this was you. life-changing for oh me. Oh, my gosh. Right? I have I every mean, book. Oh, I have great. every episode on VHS. I wrote fan mail to Leonard Nimoy okay, every year since I, sure. I mean. I mean, is he the, I couldn't believe it when he passed away because I thought this is the coolest oh, individual in the I world. I took two days and, off of work. Yeah. I was. I don't blame you. I was so upset. Yeah. Uh, have you, uh, get, getting off topic. Sorry. But no. I don't, no, I'm not sorry. <laughs> have you read his poetry? Uh, yes. Uh, I, oh. I became aware of it actually fairly recently, probably when he passed away. Oh, okay. so, oh my yeah. gosh, his poetry is yeah. great. Um, he does a great cover. Shout out Leonard Nimoy to "If I Were a Carpenter." I've heard. I've heard that. Uh, oh. I, I'm embarrassed to admit I've heard that. It's so good. Yeah, I know. Oh I my know. gosh, what a guy! What a polymath! Huh? What yeah. a what a dude! Yeah. I I love I love I him know. so much. I love the original series. I was just watching it last night. It's my comfort show. I yep. can I I know every every word by heart. Um, on this podcast, I learned. Um, we were talking about the book Project Hail Mary, mm-hmm. and I uh, we actually did an episode on it, but this was, I think it was Haley that dropped me with this information. Um, have you read Project Hail I, Mary? I started, I have to admit, I had trouble getting through it. You did? Yeah, I did. Science? I don't know what it was exactly. I, I, I just, I, I, maybe I had, it, the buildup had been so immense for me. And was I, it? I, I think my wife loved it. Somebody I, I respect and admire loved it. And I just had trouble getting into it. But I, I so I, I know the plot. I mean, I've since then. Typically, I would judge you, mm-hmm. but you like the original series. Yeah, okay, so we're still you. friends. Right. Um, but so it's about a, a star, Eridani. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And so 40 Eridani is yep. Vulcan. Mm hmm. 
supposedly that's anyway i got really excited when okay. that because i was like i want to see it through the ldt or some big telescope um yeah have you been out to the ldt yet or are you going to get to on this trip i am hoping to get to i it's been a long time i have been there in the past you have yes so the ldt the lowell discovery telescope is our research telescope just a bit south from here. Mm -hmm. It's actually now open for like public tours. Right. That's so right. that's really exciting. Which is true, I should mention, that's true of a lot of observatories where just people's breath in the building, you know, the atmosphere is important and yes. the telescopes are incredibly precise instruments. So the 200 inch uh, reflecting telescope, the Hale Telescope on Mount Palomar, I've I've been to Mount Palomar, but I've never been in the building with that telescope yeah. because of that very reason. So people shouldn't judge too harshly if they're not able to, you know, go up to the telescope and touch it or look through an eyepiece. Yes, the the eyepiece is, um, you know, like you said, it's very it's very sensitive equipment. Yep. The tours are during the day. It is huge though. It's a four point yeah. three meter. It's it really is worth insanely people, big. It's people should um, understand that. Yeah. It's very adorable. Nate, put that picture. Right here. It's so cute. Have you seen a picture of it? Yes, it's I have. It's got the teeth. I yep. love it so much. Um, but I actually did get to look through the eyepiece. There was, uh, we have the I Heart Pluto Festival every year. Oh. And uh, we had some VIP guests, which we all had on this um, this podcast. Mm -hmm. But I got to, I think Alan Stern was there, Kathy Olkin. It was, um, you know, I, I won't get into all of it. It was just amazing to be there with these people. And they put the eyepiece on, and I was there just taking photos, which uh -huh. I'm not a photographer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was just like, me, me, me. Sure. I, I can take pictures. Yeah, I'll Let me get your coffee. What yep. else can yep. I get you? I mm -hmm. want to go to the LDT when the eyepiece is on there. Uh, and I did get to look through, and I got to see the Orion Nebula oh. with color. That would be a good one. Yeah. Oh Four God. meters on the Orion Nebula. That would be a good one. I... Uh, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing to to be able to like see color yeah, up I know. there. I wish we could share that with people, which you can, of course, through a camera and, and online. Yep. But there's nothing like looking through the eyepiece. There so, really isn't. So whenever I say, so we call it electronically assisted astronomy, EAA, when I'm doing my screen with the cameras okay. on the telescopes. Mm -hmm. But I always make sure there are a couple of telescopes set up yep. that people can look through the eyepieces. Well, um, it's a it's a shame you're here on a Tuesday because, of course, we're closing early on Tuesdays. But we'll have to get you up here. Um, you've been to the Geo Valley Open Deck. Of yes, the I am astounded by it. That thing almost cost me $10,000 because <laughs> I, when I was here in May, my wife and I, we, we had been to Scout the Canyon. And then we came here and I said, we got to go to Lowell. Mm -hmm. And they had the Lunt solar telescope out and I have a pretty good little refractor telescope with Coronado solar filters on it and I looked through that lump thing and I wanted to go home and buy one of those. Fortunately there was a long lead time and so I had time to come to my senses. That and telescope made me cry. Yeah that there you go exactly it, it is astounding me... the detail you can see on the sun. Oh my Haley how many weeks did I talk about the sun after I looked yeah. through the solar telescope? Haley was so tired of hearing me talk because it was right. like, it was just amazing where it's like, because we have all day access and people are like, well, right. what are you going to do during the daytime? It's like, look at the that. star you that's bet. right there. Exactly. It's and, amazing. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one word that will also, may, may reinvigorate that feeling, which is bino viewers. I picked up something of, of this type a few weeks ago before coming here specifically for this. What they are, are... Uh, two eyepieces in what looks like a binocular frame, and you put it in your telescope and you use both eyes instead of one. Now you are still looking through one lens, so it's not true stereo vision, but something about using both eyes, the way our brains, especially on the sun. So I got these bino viewers, I stick them in my little pronto refractor, and we were having a student activities fair where we we're trying to get students interested in the astronomy club, and a colleague of mine who is a, a superb physicist and has taught astronomy for years, Paul Voitas, he comes over and he sees my bino viewers and he wants to look at the sun. Now, he and I have each looked at the sun for 40 years or something. But when you look through with two eyes, he and I were so enamored of the view of the photosphere of the sun. We were like back and forth going, wait, can you see that one thing? And they're like, students are coming up trying to look. Around. Come back later. Go away. You know? Go yeah, away. Yeah. We're shooing <laughs> students away at the activity fair because it was just the next week I sat in my front yard with bino viewers on a telescope day after day as the sun was changing 
because the particular ones I got are Denkmeyer. They're affordable. They're not crazy expensive. Depends which kind you get. The ones oh. I got are called Denkmeyer, and I am blown the F away Denkmeyer? by these, by the view through these bino viewers. Are you going to make me spend money? Well, here's... I work at a nonprofit, okay, Daniel. <laughs> here's what I'd like to do. I will come... I brought them with me, not today, but I have them up at the Grand Canyon. I will bring them back. I want to try them on your Lunt. Uh-huh. And some clear day, we should Text try them and me. see what that looks like. Text me. Okay. I'm going to give you my number. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Bye, yep. no viewers. Holy crap. We have been talking for almost <laughs> 50 minutes. This is why they have editing programs. I know, sure. but well, we do it in one take. Oh, We're right. pros. Uh, okay. Uh, man, this is freaking, you blew my mind. Uh, yeah. Dang it. I have so many questions I want to ask you. Maybe we can get you up for another episode to talk about. You tell me when to be physics. here, I'll be here. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I enjoyed your questions. Mind. You guys are great to work with. I, oh, fantastic. I really appreciate this. Oh, taking stop. the time to let me be here. That's, I mean, I, um, I have, you have a few more programs coming up. You have two more? I have, uh, I extended, as I said, I'm not leaving. They, have, right. they don't know this yet, but I'm not leaving. No, I'm leaving on the 1st of January, and I have nine more presentations nine more. between now God. and now, Including I, one on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. What, uh, I'll find out after we conclude. I want to go to that. Okay. Um, but yes, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, listeners. And if our listeners have any questions, you can always put them in the Discord. But is there a, a way to contact you? Are you on the, Here's the, the, deal. the Bird people, app? People or? tend to forget my name, even with the whole Fleisch thing. They <laughs> forget my name. But if they contact Wittenberg, Wittenberg University in Ohio... And they say, who's that bald astronomer? Guy? <laughs> they know they exactly know. <laughs> who you're asking for. I do uh, I do like to hear from people. I, okay. I, when people write to me about my books, for example, I try to respond to every single one. So if I they have it. astronomy questions, one thing for sure, if you're about to buy a telescope, talk to me or somebody like me beforehand. Because as I say, you can buy, you can spend a lot of money and get a really bad telescope, or you can spend not that much money and get a decent telescope. So yeah. I'm a resource that I hope people will take advantage of. Take advantage of it. We will, uh, we'll write down your university and everything in sure. our Discord. So people, our listeners are on, it's like a chat Great. app. So yeah, thank you so much guys for listening. And if you have any questions, let us know. Bye. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening.